If Horizon Forbidden West accomplished anything in the week it had people's attention before Elden Ring banished it to that area of the brain that faintly recalls things on the edge of sleep, is that simply removing the more obnoxious elements we've come to expect in open world games doesn't automatically make it a great open world game. Don't get me wrong, I'm not so impossible to please that I won't applaud a developer for deciding against building a game around live services or microtransactions. So what keeps Horizon Forbidden West from my hollowed list of best games to draw your attention away from the end times we find ourselves living in? It does everything right, but it does all the same things every open world game does. In a regular year, that would be enough. But this isn't a regular year because Elden Ring released and Horizon Forbidden West had the unfortunate timing of releasing just a week before it. Guerrilla Games' bad luck knows no limit, having previously released Horizon Zero Dawn less than a week before Breath of the Wild. Little wonder why I had to read through the wiki to remind myself who the main character was again, and why everyone in the game is in love with her. It's a flaw that barges into every character interaction she has. There were whiffs of Mary Sue coming off her back in the first game, namely her being created to save the world, but more so her tendency to be a temporarily embarrassed main character whenever a problem presented itself, and she had struggled over 10 seconds before coming out with a brilliant solution. So potent is Aloy's charm that every character in the game can only have one of three reactions to her. Instant respect upon Meteor, then spending the rest of the game reminding Aloy about how amazing she is fall in love with her and spend two games carrying a torch for a woman who happens to be as untouchable as the Virgin Mary, or act hostile towards Aloy but portrayed so obviously wrong why Aloy is so noble and correct that no one could ever see things from her adversary's perspective, and eventually even they too come to respect Aloy in the end. All this for a character who wrecks everyone and everything around her with her boredom or mild annoyance, which is fitting since that's all the game inspires in me. Forbidden West kicks off six months after the end of Zero Dawn. Earth's biosphere is beginning to spin out of control without Gaia's guiding hand, and the best and only visual they have for displaying a dying planet are red algae growths that grow on land and only seem to kill foxes for some reason. Outside of the hostile robots, the world seemed like it was in a pretty stable position without Gaia in the last game. At what point does the planet no longer need her and her robots to micromanage the environment? When I arrive at the center. I see you, Elizabeth. Waiting for me, even though you've been dead for a thousand years. And for a moment, I feel whole. Yes, because you push all the tier 3 subs who want to help you so much, they're practically begging away. Little wonder why you're alone and having dreams of your biological progenitor giving you hugs. Well, consider it a punishment for running out on us the very same night we beat Hades. Aloy is such an independent, assertive, and strong character that she tossed all of her character development from the first game, where she had to trust and work with people who shunned her to save the world, and instead becomes the helicopter mom for everyone on the planet, constantly shooing them away from anything dangerous, as if they haven't all grown up in the same violent robot-infested world that she has. When the majority of your problems are fixed by shooting said problems with arrows, I don't see what's so bad about having a few extra hands shooting arrows so you can run up to whichever gene lock door only you can open. It was much easier to swallow Aloy's go-it-alone approach in the first game, because she didn't know that she was out to save the world or that she was all that that important. You have to assume some responsibility of your situation, because if she dies while smoothing over everyone else's problems, the world ends. A focus. Never thought I'd get your second sight. I'll give you another one later and show you how to back up your data. Would you also explain where and how you recharge them? Because I still have no idea. A trend that has grown exponentially in recent years is the main character never shutting the hell up about what to do, something I label the hamburger helper of game progression. A door. Maybe I can open it using that battery. A light in the distance. Better check it out with my scanner. I wonder what's in that cave. Might be something useful. It's like Aloy has been trained on clickbait YouTube titles that are designed to catch your interest, but offer little in the way of content. Might as well start placing some red arrows and circles on things in the distance while you're at it. It's not as if I'm not equipped with a scanning device, pulse vision mode, waypoint markers, on-screen objectives, and two functioning eyeballs. Even my babysitter back in the day would turn on the Sega Genesis and trust me to play it alone while she grinded on her boyfriend in my bedroom. Games have reached the point where having a simple mechanic that's easy to understand is seen as a negative, so they layer on a few extra steps so people will go, ooh, I've never seen it done like that before. For instance, your first task is pick berries to heal injuries. These things grow everywhere so you rarely need to worry, and not only can you carry a large amount of them, you have a secondary snack of them to fall back on if you suck extra hard at dodge rolling. And on top of the berries, you also have craftable health potions that you will only remember on the rare occasion you run out of berries, and spend the next minute cycling through your inventory only to find you use it and never made another while dodging a robot T-Rex's tail swipes. Speaking of, the combat has become a bit overdressed. The core of it is still there. Use your bow to shoot specific pieces off of robots. I still don't really think I understand the charge mechanic. You have to charge your staff with energy by whacking enemies, then give them a big whack with a spear to give the stored energy to them, and then shoot them with an arrow to make them explode. 
By the end of pulling off that combo once, I felt like I had just prepared my taxes but was unsure if I was going to be audited by the IRS for deducting berries as a business expense. There's also power-ups and special moves, but none of them ever found a place in combat for me. I honestly even forgot I had them for most of the game. Then there's the traps you can place down but you never will since shooting things with a bow is easier and doesn't require waiting around for your enemy to charge at you. They mainly exist to fill up space in your inventory that you get stuck cycling through your plethora of useless traps and all you want is the health potion because you ran out of berries. Honestly, I think I engaged with no more than around 30% of my combat options and just fell back to scan, shoot, roll for the entire game and did just fine. Error. Public presentation file corrupted. Member recruitment file available. Do you wish to reactivate? Yeah. Reactivate. Since the regular press-friendly presentation is corrupted, the system mass of Aloy would like to play the file that reveals the truth behind the far zenith project, spelling out their actual goal of only sending the rich elite to another world. How they managed to keep that a secret when they had a queued up to play if they suffered a file error is a mystery. So everything they said back there about the next step for humanity, it was all a lie. These people only cared about saving their own skin. Can you actually blame them? The only other plan was to die fighting robots to buy time for Zero Dawn to be finished so that someday new humans could repopulate a rebuilt world. A plan that was kept secret from everyone because they knew most people wouldn't appreciate being volunteered as cannon fodder by your genetic twin. There. The backup. It should be stored in there. Far Zenith had planned to steal a copy of Gaia for use in their space colonization efforts, but they were traveling to an already habitable world in the Sirius system. Gaia would have been of little use to them. I thought Elizabeth sent the backup here, but she didn't. Far Zenith stole Gaia. You need a new copy of Gaia to save the Earth. What does it matter if Far Zenith had a stolen copy? Aloy didn't anticipate that dropping a shuttle from an old and rickety 1,000-year-old service tower might also drop the tower with it. Luckily for her, one piece of the metal structure was able to levitate in place so she could land on it before jumping to grab a cable. I'm serious, just look at this. This ain't no copy of guy you stole, you losers. But it's the mother of all logic bombs. So good luck repairing your data. Turns out that what Farzina thought was a copy of Gaia they had stolen was actually a virus, since Zero Dawn had cut onto Farzina's plan to steal a copy. And then after having their entire data center bricked by a virus, Farzina kept the virus on their system for some reason, which is why Aloy is able to watch this. One night, for less than half a minute, it glowed an angry red. From Meridian, it looked like a trick of the light. But those who were closer, atop the light, said it could not have been a reflection. Much to my dismay, they said the light rose up from the tower's base. That. Good thing AI algorithms can be seen as glowing light as they move between hardware. Otherwise, Aloy would have no lead on Silence in Hades. Why is Silence hologram wet? He's not standing here in the rain like Aloy. So once you're angry at my entirely necessary deception has faded, now why don't you come out here and find me in the Forbidden West? Considering that Silence actually needs Aloy, since she's the only one who can open a specific door for him, he should have tried to get in touch sooner instead of waiting for Aloy to finally discover that he had stolen Hades to extract all the info he could from it. He placed a lot of trust in the belief that she would return to Meridian and that people would tell her they saw Hades fly off six months ago. Returning to Meridian was Varl's idea, not Aloy's. He went inside it and it transformed, almost like the day of the battle. I can only be grateful that it's a stormy day. Few will have seen the tower change from Meridian. It was a stormy day. For like a minute while Aloy was at the top of the tower talking with Silence, then returned to bright and sunny the second she took the elevator down. I've always found it odd that Aloy straps what amounts to an iPad to her spear, and it somehow works as an interface with 1,000-year-old technology. When your mission is over, will you return to Meridian? And stay? But long enough for us to spend time to get to know each other properly, perhaps. On occasion, the game will allow you to make a choice on how to respond to someone. Choice isn't the right word to describe it, however. Since all three options are the exact same response, just a different tactic. Aloy is like a Commander Shepard who's been locked into playing strictly Paragon. For instance, when the Sun King tries to get a date with Aloy, you can be compassionate and tell him that saving the world is her only concern, use wit to explain why it just wouldn't work, or be more direct to brush him off. It's a bit like how I go about writing these sins. Sometimes witty, sometimes rude, and sometimes compassionate, but they all lead in the same direction. It doesn't matter which option you pick because they all just brush off the possible romantic interlude, perhaps because the developers want to save those options for the third game, or they just haven't figured out if Aloy is a lesbian or not yet. What's the point of ditching Varl here in Meridian? He knows exactly where Aloy is headed and will be only a few hours behind. He tracked her down before without even knowing her location. What's more, she can't cross the border to the west until the embassy meeting there. The trouble with making every character nothing but a cheerleader for Aloy is that I don't recall most of the characters from the first game when they show up. The only detail I can recall about anyone, which is by how much they simp for Aloy. This was the dude that carried a torch. This was the thirsty lady. And sadder yet, none of them move past such characterizations in this game either. Well, I guess that's sort of like a goodbye. 
I'm sorry. You? Sorry? <laughs> oh, yeah, that'd be a first. Where is this coming from? Hey, just, you know, forget it, yeah. Oh, it's nothing. It sounds like something. All right, fine. Now, after the battle at the Spire, you, you took off, you left without so much as a handshake. I mean, people like me, we fought and bled at your side, Aloy. You just, or you just disappear? What kind of person does that? He's completely right. But this is one of those moments where you get to choose the response. So no matter what, Aloy is vindicated for being a shitty friend. Well, thanks, but I've waited long enough. It's time to go. Absolutely not. This embassy depends on diligent adherence to... You shall not! Keep telling yourself that. Open the gates, please. Do not let her through that gate! That is a direct order! Turns out Aloy can activate her inner Karen power to see the manager, and insists she get her way even after it explains why he can't oblige her. Then confronts the workers when that fails. Give her a different haircut and an SUV, and no one would be writing articles praising Aloy. Forget something back in Meridian? <sighs> Look, Burl. It doesn't matter. Made it just in time. Can someone please hold Aloy's feet to the fire for her terrible behavior? I'll grant you this, to serve as proof of your right to travel into Tanakh lands. For a game subtitle Forbidden West, it remains forbidden for only the tutorial section of the game, then becomes completely bidden after 10 minutes of discussion with the Tanakh, where Aloy is given permission to travel through it. This attack on the embassy by a brutal and bloodthirsty tribal warrior that kills everyone but Aloy feels awfully similar to the first game, which also had a surprise attack by a brutal and bloodthirsty warrior which killed everyone but Aloy. <laughs> Don't have a shot! You're in an elevated position firing down onto riders. How do you not have a shot? Enough! You! Outlanders! I'll skin you both! Strange for one of the attackers to call enough when his side is winning just so he can personally go down and challenge Aloy. After you beat Gruta, Aloy gets to use his shield. But due to damage, it can only function as a paraglider. I would love to know how an energy shield is catching wind to slow your fall, but the explanation would only get sinned for attempting it. Katalo's arm was sawed off by a robot, but once they pull him out from under it, his arm has already been bandaged up and looks remarkably clean for what should be a bloody stump. And there is no way to bandage his arm while he was pinned under the machine. Yes. Permanently this time. Even like this, you're a threat to Gaia. Once I resurrect her. So you have not yet secured Gaia backup. <sighs> then Gaia is dead. Earth and you too. Despite malfunctions, I have won. Since Hades knew all along that without Gaia, the Earth's biosphere would spin out of control and die, why was he so insistent on reaching the Spire to reactivate the Pharaoh robots to kill all life if he would only be speeding up the process by a few months anyway? Silence questioned you about the mysterious signal. The one that woke you, gave you consciousness. Who sent it? Signal transmitted by Masters. And who are they? Masters look me to destroy. Earthly life. Who would want that? Data error. Memory structures disintegrated. Disintegrated is a weird term for an AI to use when referencing corrupted files. What would you know, Hades? Twice you tried to destroy life on Earth, and twice you failed. The only extinction you ever brought about is your own. And there's no tricked out lands to save you this time. You are incorrect. Three times, Hades extinguished life. What? You remember this? Yes, data intact. Non viable biospheres aborted in years 2054, 2161, 2168. Hades having aborted the biosphere three times in the past as per his programming raises a good point. Why would Gaia ever revive humanity in a fragile biosphere that could still fail? Wouldn't you wait until after the biosphere is self-sustaining to do that? Because the system was only capable of creating humans once. Did you find a backup of Gaia or not? Oh yes. I believe I did. Where? Voila. 
How fortunate, Silence chose to interrogate Haiti just steps away from the location where it was created and contains a backup of Gaia, all of which he couldn't have known until he tortured that info out of Hades. The door to the facility is jammed with naturally growing crystals called Fire Gleam. Crystals that explode doesn't strike me as something coming from our world. I got one. Two, in fact. There are two Gaia backups in the repository. Instead of grabbing both of them, Aloy takes only one. Just why? Redundancy is a good thing, as you should have learned by now in your search for a Gaia backup. Those subordinate functions. It's not a full backup. No. More like a seed from which Gaia's mind could grow if it had subfunctions with which to form a heuristic matrix. Which would also make it useless for running tests with Hades, since Hades was created to take control over a complete Gaia to reset everything if terraforming failed. Wait, wait, wait. It's useless without subfunctions, but there are subfunctions out there. The original ones. Scattered to the winds when Gaia blew herself up. They could be anywhere. You can't find them in time. They could be scattered anywhere. But as it turns out, they were all scattered only as far as southwest North America. I need you to listen closely. These intruders want the same thing you do. Gaia reborn. It's why they're here. Friends of yours? No. They don't know me. The data pulse I transmitted indicated that a Gaia backup could be recovered here was anonymous. Silence intends to turn Aloy and Gaia over to the invaders to get her out of the way of his own plans. But the Xenas only want one thing from Earth. Gaia. Which Silence assumed would be here inside this facility and not just an incomplete kernel version. Had there been a full copy of Gaia down here, they would have acquired it and then left the planet and Silence knows this, and his plan evolves escaping on their ship, which he wasn't ready to assault and take for himself yet. Well... Wow. Any idea what the hell a clone of Elizabeth Sobek is doing here? Maybe Gaia made one, when it destroyed itself a Hail Mary to repair the system. Hmm. <laughs> don't like the sound of that. Nah, don't like it. Don't want it. But the if- Nope. One's enough trouble. Eric! Yeah? Care to do a little downsizing? We're just making Jeff Bezos the villain in our games now, huh? Amazon may have controversies, but that's not enough for Jeff Bezos to stand next to the likes of Liquid Snake, Albert Wesker, and Sephiroth, and the other one is based off Eric Prince, CEO of former Blackwater Security, while the third is just Carrie Ann Moss with blonde hair. Can you guess which one will help Aloy eventually? Keep flapping your mouth. It makes a nice target. You actually think that primitive crap you got there can hurt me? That bow does a number on robots when it shouldn't, so some caution is warranted. Instead of bringing the spider down to collapse the platform, Aloy could have just jumped over the railing into the water and escaped, which is where she ends up anyway. That's a piece of metal and concrete Aloy is using as a flotation device. Doesn't normally float. After being spit out of the facility, Varla's waiting right there like he knew that's where Aloy was going to be. The guy tracked her across the country once earlier and then to the embassy. But what was his clue to be here at this river? Hey, hey, easy. Easy there. Hey, 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 hey. It's right here. And the way you were clutching it when I found you, I knew it was important. She wasn't clutching it though. It was stored in her bag. Machines tend to not function properly when you remove parts, but Aloy fixes the Utaru land god by breaking off a piece of it. What's more, this land god should be as violent as all the other terraforming robots toward humans. Ray and other machines like her, you call them gods? Land gods, yes. For generations, they provided for us, seeding and harvesting the fields of plain song. Food for all, <laughs> a miracle of endless bounty. This brings up a good point. After Gaia created and released humans back onto Earth, why didn't she create robots and technology that would assist humans in recreating civilization? She couldn't teach them human history and knowledge without Apollo, but making helpful technology would have still benefited them. Just look how much finding a focus as a child helped Aloy. They'd always enrich the soil, but for several seasons they've glutted it endlessly with mulch. The fields have turned fetid. A blight that keeps spreading. Did you ever consider, I don't know, planting the fields yourself once the land gods stopped doing it? Before the derangement, each land god left the fields and made a pilgrimage to the cave. Always in the same order. Doe first, then Ray, then me, and so on. Interesting that a tribe that has no knowledge of music history landed on those names. Cauldrons were the worst part of Horizon Zero Dawn, and they remain the worst part of Forbidden West. A tiresome series of platforming puzzles that reward you with the ability to hack more machines if you stealth approach them. A bad main character and supporting cast can still be carried by excellent gameplay as long as the game doesn't spend too much time showcasing them.
That triple pregnancy pause I just left tells you which direction her eyes went with. This is the moment where it grows even more in love with its precious words and triples the amount of conversations you have to have. Aloy gets a base of operations this time around similar to how Mass Effect does it. But unlike in those games where your party actually accompanies you, Aloy's team are confident that she's handling everything on her own, mainly because she keeps reassuring them that she is. So instead, they all stay at base and read Wikipedia entries so they can tell Aloy all they've learned while she was gone and get a sticker on their book report. I'm not joking when I say I had multiple 30-minute conversation dumps that reiterated what I just did in simpler words words, and you have to return here every single time you complete one of the game's story missions to progress. We're not going to be able to fix the biosphere without making you whole. I ran a search for your subfunctions at the Hades Proving Lab, but Minerva was the only one I found. Thankfully, the sensory capabilities of this facility are far more advanced. I will search for the others now. This facility just happens to have the ability to search for missing AI subordinate functions even though that was never a contingency Zero Dawn would have prepared for since they could never have guessed that someone would send a signal that would turn all of Gaia's subroutines Cindy and make them go rogue. The Sirius Star System. Sirius? But that's where Far Zenith, their ship. The Odyssey. Yes, that's where it was headed. But it blew up. Unless... I don't... Why make it seem like they failed? They didn't want anyone to know. They didn't want future humans to think that they were out there. The invaders Aloy met were the ones who sent the signal that caused Hades to become sentient and attempt to destroy all life on Earth, and were also the humans who escaped from Earth on a ship and fled to another planet. It was believed their ship had blown up while still in our solar system in the last game, but that was apparently a staged event to fake their death so no one could follow them, which seems to me a bit unnecessary, considering they were leaving a planet that was being killed at the hands of robots, and there was only a slim chance the Zero Dawn terraforming system would work. And even if it did, the humans that came later would not be concerned with humans light years away since they would have no way of reaching them, and the Xenus would be far more advanced technologically that Earth humans would be of little threat. Could it be that they want the planet for themselves? The strangers I ran into, they were after a Gaia backup of their own. I mean, if they did that, if they booted their own Gaia and boosted her power until she could take control of Hephaestus, and then the whole terraforming system. Then yes, the system could be used to do what the extinction signal failed to accomplish. Snuff out life, and then potentially to build an entirely new biosphere to their specifications. Yes, you heard right. The plot is about the pale face invaders here to steal the natives' land. Probably the most awkward anti-colonialism message I've ever come across. So they could be trying to do the same thing we are. But with opposite results. Extinction. Instead of salvation. Life on Earth will end in just over half a year due to environmental collapse, unless you regain Hephaestus to create functioning terraforming robots again. The Xenus are operating under the same bad logic that made Hades' plan pointless. They could simply wait in their spaceship for a few more months and the problem would take care of itself. It would take centuries to terraform the biosphere anyway, so what would a few months matter to them? Should you change your mind, you can update your objective via your focus interface at any time. Or, you could just change your mind instead of updating your objective in the focus. When my predecessor destroyed herself, the subordinate function sought physical processors capable of holding them. So in each case you will be looking for a powerful computer of some kind. Now that we're in the Forbidden West, Aloy has to travel even further west to even more Forbidden West. A quest to save the world sort of requires a journey into a dangerous land. Try as you like, you can't make California and Nevada into Mordor. And then as soon as Aloy arrives, she's immediately given an audience with the Chieftain of the Tanakh and enters his service to help him. Her reputation precedes her wherever she goes and smooths the path. This Tanakh clan at Stonecrest doesn't seem like they're dressed properly for a life in the cold mountains. This valley is infested with regardless rebels. The scouts from the village tell us that they've been moving machines through here for days. You can also look down and see them from the village. Pretty sorry tactics from Regala, she doesn't even try to conceal her men's movements. Tell Hakaro, with all due respect, that we will keep our challengers here for as long as we are safe behind the bulwark. Clearly, Takotsa stating that means that if he blow up his defensive wall, he will honor the call and send his men off to the trial by combat. So that's Aloy's brilliant plan. And she sets out to do it by stealing a cannon from a robot elephant that Regala's men captured. We will... We will rebuild it! Immediately! You are not safe. The bulwark couldn't protect you from a single cannon. That's not a fair statement. The only reason Aloy was able to destroy the bulwark was due to the old world tank buried inside of it that she blew up, meaning their bulwark would have actually been a good defense against Regala's forces since they wouldn't have known to exploit that. There are only two viable ways to attack the arena. Through the throne room you just passed, 
and by the trail on the north end. We've set up barricades at both. But if Regala means to assault the cool route with machines, she will have to attack by the trail. Since everyone knows that Regala will attack the cool route, why only set defenses when you could be sending a trap to take her out? Get to the weapon! If I can draw that thing close, open fire! It's in the middle of the arena. You're talking about a few more meters closer at best. Drawing it any further would only bring it under the firing line of the ballista. No way would Aloy's 120 pounds be enough to stop a jet aircraft from falling. This isn't finished! I'll be back with everything I have! And all who stand with Hakaro will be run red. Don't all try and stop her at once from escaping. It's not like you have her surrounded and alone inside your fortress with bows you could shoot her with. I name you all, Marshal. Your first order is to secure the arena from any remaining rebels. Maybe order them to go kill Regala since she still has to be inside the compound. Something that doesn't make any sense to me is that when Guy claims that merging Aether, Demeter, and Poseidon with her will allow her to stave off ecological collapse for a bit longer. But to stop it altogether, she requires Hephaestus, the sub-parameter that controlled the creation of terraforming robots. Changing weather patterns, water pH, and plant life would also require terraforming robots since those are what carry out the environmental changes. How exactly is Gaia temporarily fixing the weather, plants, and oceans without control over the robots? that do it. Gaia received a secret and difficult to notice transmission from Eleuthia on a private line or subroutines use, requesting help at a facility. When she goes to investigate, Aloy finds a Zenith fighting Tanakh rebels who use a weapon that bring down her shield. The rebels were here on Silence order to wait for a Zenith to test the weapon on. How Silence knew a far Zenith would show up here is unknown since only Gaia could detect the SOS. With the addition of more Elizabeth Sobek clones, Aloy's legion of torch carriers at least stand a better chance of getting a date. Be careful when you take on Farzinus. They are ruthless, and they have Eleuthia, Artemis, and Apollo now. How did Farzina find Eleuthia and Artemis when those didn't even show up for Gaia's skin, but also failed to find Aether, Demeter, and Poseidon, which did? Beta and Aloy's character dynamic is the only interesting one I encountered in the whole game, and not for the reason the game wants me to. As I've overstated many times to make sure you can't possibly miss my point, Aloy is a sublimely skilled and competent character that everyone loves and respects. Beta, on the other hand, is a far more realistic version of Aloy. She's the person who might write a Mary Sue self-insert character of herself during one of her more bored and depressed moments. I see the author and its creation interacting, and even the Mary Sue expresses frustration and annoyance toward herself. The descendants of Farzenith escaped a dying planet. And now they want to claim Earth for themselves? Not their descendants. What? Not their descendants. It, it, it's them. The same ones who left Earth a thousand years ago. You didn't know? How can they still be alive? They don't even look... What did they do to themselves? I believe it's a combination of pharmaceutical cellular treatments and technological implants. And, and you? Does that mean that you are... I'm not like them. I was made. On the way to Earth. Being a clone doesn't make you any more natural than 1,000-year-old billionaires. Cloning is a form of biological immortality, after all. The Zenus needed Elizabeth's gene print to access Zero Dawn facilities. So they made you. I can understand Aloy and the primitive people of Earth not being able to get past gene-encoded doors, but would technologically advanced humans really need to go to the trouble of making an Elizabeth clone? In the last location where Beta hit herself away, the Zenus tunneled through several meters of solid rock and ice with ease. I don't think a steel door is that big of an obstacle to them. Aristotle and Aspasia. The avatars of the Archive would assign me learning modules and evaluate my progress. Wait, those names? They were designed to be the virtual guides for the Apollo database before Ted Farrow purged it. The Zeniths have a copy. So for a thousand years, the colonists of Far Zenith never upgraded from the Apollo database they were given by Elizabeth. They were fine using what had to eventually become a slow and outdated system. They're not going to find us. Guy is using Minerva to mask our location. What difference does it make? You're too far behind. We're never going to beat them. Everything. Everyone. I'm going to die. You turned over the only other Gaia colonel to Aloy, so they can't recreate Gaia themselves anymore without that and you. They can't beat you at this point. Aloy comes across a group of Osram in the ruins of Las Vegas, attempting to get inside a giant underwater city buried there. And Aloy, being the character she is, instantly becomes best friends with the leader of them, and improves on his idea for a submersible by creating a rebreather from other parts so she can go down herself. He's all too happy to watch someone else live out his dream and instantly one up his designs. There's only one other character in modern games that is as narratively coddled as Aloy, and that's Sora from Kingdom Hearts. The size of the valves Aloy opened and the amount of water inside this structure containing the Las Vegas Strip means Aloy should be waiting at least several months for all of it to drain. How exactly did the Loch Ness robot monster get inside? This is a sealed underground city that wasn't flooded with water until the Azuram entered, and Poseidon triggered the flooding. Was it just sitting around on dry land before? And there's no explanation for why it would be here. It's built for terraforming the ocean. You can't terraform a sealed aquarium in the desert. You know, I used to watch this a lot too. 
whenever I wanted to take my mind off things. The difference being you were a child when you repeatedly watched that recording. Beta is an adult. One day, a data channel opened in my training interface. In it, Tilda was waiting for me in a virtual replica of a house on a cliff overlooking the ocean. It was beautiful. She showed me paintings, books, media files. We met there in secret many times. This is said to suggest Tilda might be one of the good Zeniths, but later after it's revealed that she was in a relationship with Elizabeth Sobek and still carries a torch for her, this comes off as incredibly disturbing, since the 1,000-year-old lesbian was DMing the underage clone of her old flame. What else can you tell us about Tilda? She... liked to talk about her paintings. What about herself? Did she ever talk about her life on Earth, how she joined the Zeniths, something like that? She never said much about herself, and she hated it when I asked too many questions. Yeah, that's called grooming. Aloy kills all the Quinn tribesmen guarding this location where the next AI is found, then comes across Alva, one of the Quinn diviners whom they were guarding, and Alva still manages to become infatuated with Aloy, despite her just killing several people that were here to protect her. Look in the GH facility section. Like I said, a lost file. You can't see the map? It's okay. It looks like your focus is an early model. The operating system won't be able to read any files created after the mid-2050s. If Alva's older model focus is unable to view files past the 2050s, then how did Quinn society manage to learn so much about Ted Pharaoh, Zero Dawn, and the Pharaoh Plague that destroyed the world? Those were all events that happened in the 2060s, meaning their older focuses couldn't see or read the files relevant to them. That's a one-handed, effortless lift of a steel hatch that has to weigh hundreds of pounds and with joints corroded by rust for a thousand years. This facility is where the Pharaoh Plague's ability to convert biomass and energy was created. They were also working on something to stop the Pharaoh robots called the adamantine wreath, a plant-like vine that pharaoh robots couldn't convert and would choke them up. But Aloy needs to get past one blocking the way to Demeter, and the solution for defeating is to whack it a few times and then download a key into it. This was supposed to be something to stop the pharaoh plague, a swarm of robots that were known for hacking everything they came across. It's hard to explain, but you and I are working toward the same goal. And if I succeed, your people won't need any data. Things will just... they will get better. I've never heard such a convincing argument before. Help me and things will just get better for your people. Also, Aloy doesn't need any of Alva's help for this. She's spending all of her time just explaining the past to her. Said before about I can let it slide that the Quinn guards missed their shot on Aloy earlier, but this time she was standing still in a room and was unaware of them behind her. L look at her! Can't you see? Elizabeth Sobek stands before you! An ancestor reborn! Alva kept that she recognized Aloy to herself pretty well despite Aloy being the equivalent of the apostle in her culture. It is too large to be beamcast, and the kernel you have been using could never hold it. Therefore, it must be contained in a location with a direct physical connection to me. A place with two data cores. Two cores? Where would we find a place like that? Gemini. An abandoned cauldron in the desert west of here. Seismic activity disrupted the original construction. Two data cores were built as a result. Why would the original Gaia build large data cores for holding AIs when she was the only AI at the time? I did a test. Hephaestus has written Alpha Clearance out of its access module. You'll never be able to capture it. Then we need a higher level of clearance. There is no higher... Ted Pharaoh's mega clearance. The one he used to purge the Apollo database and kill the Alphas. But to get it, you would have to find Thebes. The private bunker he retreated to when the world ended, and nobody knows where that is, not even the Zeniths. Their only intel was that it was somewhere in San Francisco. Luckily, Aloy just ran into a tribe who worshipped Ted Pharaoh, and also weirdly know where his bunker is located. Problem introduced, problem instantly solved. May I present our honored CEO. CEO, as in CEO. I can feel the riders in the meeting room biting their lip when someone above them on the ladder suggested that name. What is your purpose? I'm looking for a place called Thebes. 
And what do you seek there? I think Seo's actor was just told to act like he was hiding his true nature and goals from Aloy. But these characters are acting like reluctant teenagers in a school play who only memorized their lines last night. It contained details about the construction of a great underground palace. Where exactly? Close. Beneath the Great Pyramid in the ruins beyond. And it was hard to find out where Ted Farrow's bunker was located. Why? He built a friggin' pyramid over it and named it Thebes. His last name is Pharaoh, as in Egyptian Pharaoh, one of which is also famous for bringing about plagues on Earth. Oh, why are you dressed like Ted Farrow? I am Pharaoh, renewed. My essence is the same as his. Across the years, across the generations, his soul is my soul. His will is my will. Here's some rich irony for you. The game portrays Sio as a deluded ruler who believes himself to be the reincarnation of Ted Farrow. But it fails to realize that Aloy and Sio are more or less the exact same. Only in Aloy's case, she is the reincarnation of Elizabeth Sobek. And just as revered, if not more so, by everyone. I would delight in seeing Aloy knock down a peg or three just like the game is setting Sio up for. Even if Ted Farrow was weird enough to want to design a survival bunker after actual Egyptian pharaoh tombs, the irony couldn't possibly be lost on him that he was simply designing his own elaborate tomb full of people and expensive things that would accompany him here in death. The writers have bitten off their entire bottom lip by this point. Ted Farrow kept two of the pharaoh plague corruptors inside his bunker for protection. What exactly kept them powered down here? These things absorb biomatter to power the reactors and all it's down here is some stone and metal. Ted Farrow also went with gene therapy to prolong his life, except his version didn't work out as well as Azenus and he eventually mutated into a brain-dead teratoma after killing everyone in his bunker. With Ted being an Elon Musk clone and Jeff Bezos leading the Zenus, it seems the devs prolong the life of every billionaire people enjoy dunking on on Twitter just so they can be dunked on in the future as well. Those poor writers have jumped out the window of the office at this point. Who am I kidding? I'm giving the writers too much credit. They probably proposed it themselves then high-fived each other over what a great message they were creating. Just like that, huh? The Omega override is just pulled up and downloaded. No password protection or anything. This is the property of someone so paranoid that he installed kill switches into every person he allowed into his bunker. Burn it to ash. Wait, no. Pharaoh has it rigged to melt down if- Ted set up a self-destruct in his bunker when there was no one left alive inside it but himself. Ted Pharaoh got his own poetic justice, and so does Sio, who believed himself to be the reborn Ted Pharaoh. It's very cute. I like to think this game got its poetic justice once Elden Ring buried it in cells. You're going to need a little help to reach our base. Varl? I made a new friend. I need you to meet her at the Quen Ferry and escort her back. You could lead her there yourself instead of having Varl come all the way out and do it. I mean, you're on your way back to base, but such is the direction of open world games. The fact that the player might not want to return to base at this point has to be accounted for. The net effect is that absorbing Hephaestus will take longer than previously calculated. How long? Even with Omega clearance, my current estimate is that the merge will take 35 hours. And each hour increases the risk of detection by the Zeniths. Two cores. Two overrides. What if the merge were carried out by two clones of Elizabeth Sobek, both armed with Omega clearance? Entering the password twice doesn't speed up a computer process. The only way to decrease the time of a task is to increase the compute, and the personal clearance is made for one person to use. Trying to use it with two different devices at the same time would likely trigger a firewall since that isn't how it would be designed to work. And furthermore, instead of endangering Beta by dragging her along for the mission, Aloy could just walk to the other side of the room and activate the Omega clearance on the other device after activating the first one. There's no difference in how you do it. You're right. I don't understand. We have the same genes, the same mind, the same heart. So why can't you find the strength to do what has to be done, like Elizabeth would? Ironically, the only person who ever makes Aloy lose her boring uber confidence is herself. I look through all the data from your focus. You were raised as an outcast, shunned, and isolated just like me, so what's the difference? What's my defect? Here's the thing. Beta is a more interesting and all-around better character than Aloy could ever be. Because she has those defects and issues she can't overcome so easily. So making her easily overcome her issues right now would be the worst thing you could possibly do for all their when did it. Beta. Look, it's not a piece of Elizabeth. The difference is... I had him. Somehow Aloy telling Beta that she's a wimp because she didn't have a strong male father figure in her life improves her mental state enough to go on the mission even though she's done nothing to actually soothe her anxiety or nihilism. Walk it off and get a dad at least requires her finding a dad first. You have to promise me one thing. Yes, of course. If it goes bad, if the Zeniths find us, 
I don't want to be their slave again. Do you understand? Whenever the main character promises to kill someone rather than let them be taken, the promise is never upheld and always results in the exact same scenario. Person A is captured and Person B, who made the promise, will have their moment to take the shot and fail to, vowing to save them instead. It's cracked. Look! I really don't get how an AI subroutine escapes from a crack in the data container. It's a program running off a distributed cloud of cauldrons. Since this is another forced cauldron mission, I'll just send it again for the same stated reason as earlier. I assume that moving those holograms around is removing Ephesus's malicious code. I don't know how you can have two people using air guitar programming at the same time on the same file, possibly rewriting completely different sections and somehow have it work. All that preparation of sending off electromagnetic pulses at other cauldrons to mask what they were doing from the Zenus amounted to nothing. If you set up a problem, said you solved it, and then have the problem still occur with no changes, you've just wasted my time. Eric, get beta. I don't think the Zeniths even need Beta anymore. Gaia is currently absorbing Hephaestus, and they can make a new Sobek clone as well. Varl dies. I'm supposed to care. I think Aloy was supposed to care as well, since this is why she kept saying she had to do all this by herself because it was too dangerous to go with her. A better writer would now have Aloy double down on this belief, since she's now seen her worst fear realized. But the entire final act is about working with her friends in even more dangerous situations. Allow me to introduce you to a concept that far too many game developers rely on. Let's knock the main character out to save them from an otherwise hopeless situation. Tilda switches sides since there being the one reasonable Xena that was already brought up, and saves Aloy by creating a blinding flash of light and flying away with her. Then because no one can ever act like a real human, plops her in a bed to wake up on her own so she can communicate over the focus while Aloy explores her art gallery. Whatever insights I'm supposed to gleam about her character from the art she talks endlessly about is lost because I'm trying to figure out what sort of person would do this to begin with. This is what serial killers would think of doing, not lesbians carrying a torch for their old girlfriend. You truly are Elizabeth's blood. With her drive, her sense of mission, her integrity. Did she have any human flaws? Anything that could have made her and Aloy relatable? So what made you suddenly turn on them? Quite simply, this. I held focus. Aloy destroyed that focus back at the Hades training facility, and then it would have fallen into the water after the platform collapsed during her fight with Eric. Finding something that small and all that wreckage when you didn't even know it would be there is a little hard to believe. No. We must recover Beta and Gaia at all costs. By now you must know that Gerard intends to use Gaia to reboot the Earth's biosphere. Remaking this world to specifications that would only suit us immortals. This process will kill every living thing on the planet. He calls it a clean install. That is the assumption Gaia and Aloy came to. But the idea that the Xenus adapted to their new planet and Earth is unsuitable for them now, therefore they have to wipe it clean and terraform it into something else, still makes no sense. Adapting to an environment through evolutionary changes only happens across generations of offspring undergoing environmental pressure. The Xenus are the same colonists that left Earth 1,000 years ago. They would still be adapted to Earth's environment. What's more, they possess genetic engineering technology advanced enough to indefinitely prolong their life and health. Altering their genetics to the minor changes they may have experienced once on another planet shouldn't be so much of an issue that they would need to sit in orbit for centuries while Earth is destroyed and remade. This is all a lie, of course, but the logic makes so little sense that Gaia and Aloy should have seen right through it. The others became obsessed with a kind of effortless immortality. They built a colony where machines serviced their every need, where any memory or fantasy could be endlessly savored in virtual reality. It wasn't life. It was stultifying. Yes, it sounds horrible. Since Gerald is obviously based off Jeff Bezos, creating a world where no one needs to work makes him seem like a pretty decent guy. Unfortunately, this game doesn't bother developing any of the far zenith colonists beyond what people imagine the wealthy are like on Twitter. But how did he come up with a weapon that can take down your shields? That's the one thing I haven't been able to figure out, but however he did it, I'm quite certain it will work. With it in the Tanakh army, victory seems to be within his grasp. Tilda is a Zenith and is wearing one of those personal shields right now. On top of that, she's a former information spy and is knowledgeable of software and hardware. You're telling me she doesn't have her own way of disabling the shield she uses every day? And plans to rely on Silent's invention? Something created by a primitive man who should have no idea about Zenith technology? But she's certain it will work. The data channel. It still exists, doesn't it? I need you to open it. Let me talk to Beta. 
Since Aloy is against the plan of allowing Regala to take control of the Tanakh and throw themselves against the Zenith base, she comes up with a new plan involving Beta. Our perspective switches to Tilda as Aloy whispers instructions to Beta over the secret data channel Tilda controls. I guess she can't listen in on her own data channel that she just opened for someone else. Aloy's just whispering into a microphone at her focus. She isn't actually leaning down to whisper in Beta's ear. I'm with child, Aloy. I was wondering why they allowed one of the good guys to die. They went with the old, he knocked a woman up before dying trope. Aloy drops an EMP on Regala's army to shut down all the robots. However, the robot Aloy is flying on isn't affected by the EMP despite being in the same area. After beating Regala and saving the Tanakh, you have another fake choice to make. It's a fake choice because all you really do is delay her death, since she dies early in the final mission if you bring her with you. So meet me at my base. Mountains west of Plainsong. Time to submit to the inevitable silence and follow the person who actually knows what she's doing. Don't be late. I present you the Karen who gets to save the world. Thoughts on our new Zenith acquaintance? I'd say she smells like death, but even death smells of something. She's more like a cold piece of metal, bent on repelling all semblance of life. But what's your opinion on Tilda, not Carrie Ann Moss? In addition, they've also been ferrying materials to and from our ship in orbit. After hundreds of years, Luxuriating in our digital comforts, the ship was barely space-worthy when we made our escape. The Zeniths came back to Earth on the same spaceship they left on. There's no way a ship in orbit around a planet would still be working after a thousand years. And you returned to Earth in just 20 years when it took you over 300 to reach your initial destination. So clearly it had to have been upgraded. Tell me about the weapon. How does it work? I've upgraded the delivery system. It now emits a wave-like effect covering a significant distance. <sighs> that doesn't fully answer my question. No, but I'd be a fool to reveal its inner workings. It's also because they don't have a satisfying answer. Since revealing that your enemy has technology that makes him invincible, and then countering that with something that simply turns it off, is incredibly unimaginative. About your Zenith ally, I wonder if you understand what kind of person you're dealing with. For someone to live as long as she has, outlast as many calamities, well, your goals may be aligned now but I'd watch for the moment they diverge. Silence actually knows the full truth about why the Zenus really returned to Earth, which he learned from Hades, but refuses to tell Aloy any of it, even though he has to know that Tilda plans to betray them at some point, and he has no plan to stop her when she does. There will still be Spectre drones scores of them. If only we had an army to fight them. I've got that under control. You'll know when you need to. Why though? Why does anyone other than the Zenus need to be surprised by whatever plan Aloy and Beta concocted? Aloy is keeping her plan secret because she doesn't fully trust Tilda, but Tilda wouldn't be against the plan to use terraforming robots to attack the Zenus that Aloy and Beta came up with. Beta's role was to release a Thesis into the Zenus system after the regulator was destroyed by Aloy's friends, allowing it to print machines that could then attack the Zenus Spectre robots. This also means they no longer have Thesis to merge with Gaia so you don't even accomplish the goal of restoring her to save the world from environmental collapse in this game. I guess they didn't want Horizon 3 lacking RGB colored robots to fight. You know there never was a part of the plan that specified how they would get all the Zeniths in one place to use Silent's one and only device to remove their shields, so the plot just has all of them fly down and talk shit. We can't let Gerard escape. It won't take long before he preps the shuttle for launch. Then he'll be able to take Beta and Gaia into orbit and onto the Odyssey beyond our reach. Why hasn't he already done that? Gerald had everything he needed after Gaia and Beta were captured. He's wasting time sitting around here on Earth. I don't need a shield to take you out. Why would Eric's suit, which is built with an impenetrable shield covering him at all times, also come with a helmet and body armor? You can just cut energy bands with a metal spear. What even is that computer interface? Nemesis. What is it? It is us. The minds of Far Zenith. Or failed copies of them, anyway. Back on Sirius, some of my peers weren't satisfied with physical immortality. They wanted digital transcendence. A way to upload their minds into any form, organic or mechanical. Nemesis was a failed experiment to that effect. Abandoned, but never erased. An immense database of our memories, emotions, and prejudices left to fester. So you're telling me that the true villain who sent the signal to corrupt Hades and wipe out life on Earth is the stored privilege and class animosity of the digital copies of a bunch of billionaires that were abandoned and felt angry enough over that to destroy the planet, then chase the remaining 10 or so survivors across space and attempt to destroy their home world as well? Okay, bring those writers back into the meeting room, lock them in, and leave them in there to starve so they have to eat each other to survive. 
I loved Elizabeth more than you could ever know. And I let her stay behind to die with the rest of humanity, a mistake I have regretted for a thousand years. Now she stands before me again. You've been carrying a torch for over a thousand years. I hate to tell you this, but Elizabeth and Aloy are not that compelling. You can't force me, Tilda. Your shield is gone. I have something better. Spectre Prime, to me. I love you, and I'm going to use the biggest and deadliest robot I have to beat you into submission and make you come with me. Now it's time for me to leave this doomed planet behind to seize the Odyssey in the Apollo database and begin a new chapter in my pursuit of knowledge. I don't think you know how to fly a spacecraft. You're the most brilliant Bronze Age man in the world, but still a Bronze Age man. Help me fight that thing. Perhaps Tilda didn't adequately define the threat. Nemesis can't be stopped. It destroyed a highly advanced Zenith colony in a matter of hours. What hope does this primitive tribal Earth have? I have long felt that primitive humans should have stood no chance in the fight against the terraforming robots of Earth, and even less of a chance against the Zenith who have more advanced technology. Somehow I get the feeling that a bow and arrow will destroy whatever Nemesis creates as well. You're staying. For a time. You people are going to need all of the help you can get. Silence, the one character who remained immune to Aloy's non-existent charm, finally gives in and acts out of character to stay on Earth instead of leaving. Sarcasm.